So now we're gonna we're gonna talk about just a quick overview of of a pistol, um, semi semi automatic pistol. Um, <clears throat> this what I have here again. Like I said, I have a ton of uh, airsoft um, devices, guns that I use as uh, training aids. So uh, it's safe for me, safe for everyone around me. So it gives an opportunity where folks can see, touch, and uh, get an idea of what something looks like. And um, the, the threat of a live round being in a gun has been removed completely, not even mitigated, it's just completely removed. So a lot of the stuff that I use even on my videos are not, um, you know, either they're not loaded if they're actual firearms and or I've disabled them to a point where a mistake can't be, I mean, there's no way of making a mistake. They're the firing pin or, or a bolt carrier group or something's been removed from that gun so they can't fire a live uh, round. I just take that stuff very seriously. So this here is something that I actually take I First year and a half, two years in the military, when I was in the reserves, I carried a 1911 in the infantry as a, a radio um, telecommunications operator or radio telephone operator. Um, and that was, I carried a 1911 and I had my radio backpack stuff and I think it was a uh, Prick 77 and then the Singards. And then after that, um, we went to this. Uh, when I went on active duty and to some of the units, the, the, this was the primary um, pistol, firearm for US military, small arm for like almost 20 something years, 30 years. And that's the uh, uh, Beretta 92 FS. Um, it has, this one has like a um, safety to it. Um, magazine, if I remember correctly, the magazine held, you know, 15 rounds, um, but you only put 14 because um, in most instances, if you put more than a certain amount of rounds, it would kind of jam up uh, unless you heavily oiled it and uh, you actually knew that gun. I kept my gun very clean uh, on my deployments. Um, so this magazine comes out the bottom. That's how it feeds the rounds and then the, the rounds come in through here and they get fed through that chamber. They get they get seated in there and like I said, this is this is an airsoft, so you know I can actually show you how oops, I can pull the the thing to this and I can actually get it to fire that um like i said the the eight the the bread of 92 uh was for a long time and you know even today maybe there's still some military units reserve units out there that are still carrying this gun um you know it, it shoots nine millimeter um i think in the other video that i put about the ar i forgot to bring up the fact that a lot of these guns a lot of these rifles don't shoot just one specific round. So the Breda 92 sh shoots nine millimeter, but it also shoots a 40 caliber round if it's chambered for that. Um, and I'm not certain, but it could also, they probably chamber it for other uh, rounds such as the 380 and or the 22. So uh, like the ARs, it's not just the 223 and 5.56. Um, there's other rounds that can be um, it could be chambered for so you know do your research on you can check on YouTube there's plenty of great YouTube videos that just talks about chambered different rounds for different weapon systems um, the one that we used in the military was uh, a jacketed hot no it wasn't jacket I digress I was gonna say hollow point but in the military I don't know if it's changed but you couldn't have a hollow point round in in a military gun it had to always have be a, a full metal jacket and it, it i think it had something to do with the um nato and some kind of um uh the hague in geneva the G geneva convention with reference to 
the rules of you know what how weapon systems are used in the battlefield so just something that came up i just thought about it so anyway long story short this is what a semi-automatic semi pistol looks like um most semi-automatic pistols come in two uh in two types when it comes to the trigger this would be considered a double action then after the first squeeze it, it from going from double action it would be a single action um after that first shot so it, after you shoot the first shot and the, the the whole thing goes and the round um this is what the gun would look like and it would go to single action and then after every round keeps pushing that thing back there it's going to be in single action mode so it it's a lot lighter on the trigger the trigger um pull is way lighter on the second shot so i don't know if that's the reason when i was in the military my my first shot was always to one side or to the other i i usually always um got expert but at the same point i was wondering why is it that well it's probably because of the way I pulled back on that trigger and my, my, my discipline and anticipating the shot and a couple other things. But also uh, a contributing factor would probably be that double action. Uh, some guns, uh, such as like the MMP, Smith & Wesson MMP or um, uh, Ruger, some guns are just double action with a safety clock. They have a safety in the trigger and uh, they don't have a double action, single action mode. Um, 1911s would be, you know, that other exception where, you know, they're always single action because they're locked and cocked. And so that rear part is locked back and they're always set up in that, in that method. So the, the shooter just puts it in from uh, safe to fire and squeezes the trigger. So. There's always uh, different variants of the semi-automatic pistol, different ammunition that can be used. Not any one pistol will only use one type of ammunition. You could find a pistol that they out there in the market that may be able or may be chambered for different types of ammunition. So be aware of that. So like you come across a Beretta 92 and it says 4-0 on the side of it, don't put nine millimeter ammunition there. You know, be aware of that. So that's my that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Another thing to add is just that uh, whenever you have a semi-automatic pistol or any type of firearm that you plan on carrying, open carry or concealed carry, always consider what type of holster you're going to be um, carrying it with. Um, this gun specific, uh you know, the outside the waistband uh, holster uh, is, is, a, is appropriate. I've seen this gun used by police and law enforcement agencies, also for private use. I've seen holsters uh, like shoulder holsters. They tend to be uncomfortable, but people know how to wear it better or they know how to, um, how to manage it, you know, with their clothes. So it all depends on the user. You know, I won't knock on anything because everybody has uh, developed maybe some kind of uh, skills and they practiced and they wear their clothing and their holster and it's all consistent. Uh, if you're new to this, those are things you have to think about. You need to think about the, the holster, the gun, what you wear so if you're going to the beach you're not going to wear well if you're going to the beach in beach shorts or swim trunks you're not going to wear uh, a, a beretta with uh outside the waistband on your swim trunks it's just it might you know unless you're some parts of the country i know in uh here in nevada people would probably look at you a little weird the first time and let it kind of let it slip because we've had especially in my neighborhood i've seen guys walking around in you know hawaiian shorts with uh you know a wild west style holster with two 1911s while they're walking a poodle so <laughs> it all depends on where you're at in the u.s you have to consider your the community and your environment when, when it comes to something this big um 
you probably wouldn't would consider like inside the waistband holster or certain type of clothing or in the winter time a jacket uh if you're wearing it concealed and if it's you know if you're have the appropriate permissions in the jurisdictions that you may be so keep that in mind the, the holster is a huge component of the gun so when you buy the gun or you you, you get a hold or you're issued a a, a, a gun a, a pistol a, a, a semi-automatic firearm of this size you're gonna have to really think about how are you gonna transport it how are you gonna store it and how are you gonna holster it because I mean all that takes uh, it's a component of the whole your life cycle or survival cycle of carrying a gun professionally or even when in, in, in personal or home defense so um, there's a saying out there in the industry they talk about light is right I believe in it I believe that uh, especially for personal defense if uh, you have a semi-automatic gun they make uh, 9 millimeter and 380 Beretta makes Smith & Wesson Glock they all make a smaller version of a gun a lighter gun a smaller gun that's more concealable or even for outside the waistband it's more comfortable those are things you should consider um, me personally I, the way I look at it uh, it's all about necessity so it whatever fits your lifestyle and it makes it where you're doing it in a safe manner is the way you need to look at it and approach the whole the, the whole thing um, I know that if like I cross the border into another state such as California uh, the restrictions of that state and how federal laws apply to it to those restrictions might limit me to what I can and can't do and um, the types of guns firearms semi-automatic pistols that can or cannot go into that state I mean so you really gotta do some reading some research because at the end when you get um, tied up in a situation or they call it getting clowned in the cuffs uh, you, there's not going to be an excuse uh, your lack of research is not going to prevent you from getting into trouble so these are things you even and I'm talking to even I know we have the law enforcement officer safety act but I hate to say it this way but a state like California is not necessarily observed in some jurisdictions and they, they may not major serious criminal uh, penalties not may not come across but something could happen um, and it might take up your time for no reason so you have to consider the realms of the environments and communities that you will be exposed in and and like I said when when it comes to light is right if it's completely concealed and you're you're you have all the appropriate permits licenses or uh, whatever things that you need for that jurisdiction um, then you've completely removed that concern and you've taken it out and so in most instances nobody knows that you're carrying and so you're putting yourself in a situation where now you have a better advantage when it comes to um, doing what it, the permits or the licenses are intended for for you to carry concealed but um, if you're on duty, like security or law enforcement, whatever it may be, um, I actually recommend, I prefer carrying a full size firearm in most instances because of the, the, what they're set up for, you know? So um, they, they actually are um, the opportunity of, you know, better shot placements and, you know, your, your, practice you know there's a lot of things that is of benefit in some agencies they're, they're gonna want for you to only carry their issued a duty weapon when you're off duty so if you get called out after hours they're gonna want you to respond with the duty weapon that's issued to you uh, I've come across folks and this is years back where they're carrying all kinds of crazy stuff and then they got called out and their duty weapon was at home but they had you know I don't know um, a desert eagle or something and you know people were asking them you know fall into a maybe internal affairs 
or some type of bad spot where they're being looked at in a negative light because they're doing something that maybe they weren't supposed to do or wasn't consistent with the agreements or policies that um, they signed on when they became a law enforcement or police officer. So this is it. This is a semi-automatic pistol, at least a, a copy of it. Um, this is Airsoft. And uh, this is something that uh, if you ever have a need or a requirement or whatever it may be, you know, let me know. Um, I also can offer you the Arizona um, uh, armed guard qualification course with a pistol or a revolver. I will be doing, we will be doing an overview of a revolver in, in the next few um, videos. And so if you need to do your eight hour, 16 hour course and need to qualify, um, I'm available. And then again, um, I could also recommend you to uh, training schools in the state of Arizona that I even use, that I have a lot of confidence in, and um, that also offer the course um, specifically down in Southern Arizona. I'm up in Northern Arizona most times, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to take away from that opportunity for you to receive the best training uh, available if you know to prevent travel issues or whatever maybe but at the same point if you're up in the northern area or um, it's a scheduling thing or whatever it may be I'm more than happy to give a short class uh, whatever the state requirement is the eight hour 16 hour that you're required to take for your qualification for the Arizona um, armed guard or your CCW and uh, I do the CCW pretty much liberally around the country, depending on different jurisdictions. And so uh, if you, you or any of your family members or co colleagues are looking for um, some training when it comes to the semi-automatic pistol or the revolver or some type of hybrid firearm for CCW purposes, let me know. Um, I'm more than happy to give a class. And if you need a class specifically catered to your organization or your family community needs, let me know because we'll build it to, to your um, exact needs in accordance with, you know, uh, industry standards. Put that away. Off to the next video.